Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public. Welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight we have with us Dr. Peter Gerges, who is the Loeb Associate Professor of Natural Sciences at Harvard University. He received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and followed that with postdoctoral work at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute before joining the Harvard University Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology in 2005. Dr. Gerges's research focuses on physiology and biochemistry of deep sea life called extremophiles. These are organisms that live in and around hydrothermal vents, uh, uh, conditions where we would not expect any life at all. His investigations concern several important questions. First, how microorganisms, particularly in such an extreme place, obtain and process energy. Second, how such organisms affect local and global biogeochemical cycles. Dr. Gerges is also involved in an exciting application of this area of science. Tonight, Dr. Gerges talks to us about the unique environment of the hydrothermal vents, the surprising ecosystems supported by the vents, and the adaptations that have made it possible for organisms to survive there. He'll also discuss the potential energy of this peculiar ecosystem in the form of something called bioreactors, one of his signature areas of research and innovation. Dr. Gerges, welcome. Thank you. And to start off, could you give us, the naive among us here, the, the public, could you give us a little background about this peculiar environment that is a very interesting area of science today? Uh, well, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we often forget being uh, land-dwelling organisms is that 80% of our biosphere is actually deep ocean, right? So 80% of all habitable places on Earth are ocean that are deeper than a thousand meters. Uh, the deep ocean is also a place of immense pressure and perpetual darkness, right? So it's a world really different than ours. Um, the pressure uh, on average in the deep ocean is about 400 atmospheres, and that's about the same as you balancing 30 jumbo jets on your body, right? Uh, and it is a world of perpetual darkness, so sunlight yeah. never penetrates there. Right. The longest mountain chain on Earth, the mid-ocean ridge system, is in the deep ocean. 90% of all volcanic activity takes place in the deep ocean. Yeah, that's amazing. And for amazing. you trivia buffs out there, for the trivia buffs, um, there's enough gold suspended in the ocean to give each person on Earth about nine pounds. We'll all be diving oh, tomorrow. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, good, good luck with that. There's uh, quite a lot of effort that's gone into uh, 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 seeing if we can extract gold from the oceans, but that's another subject for another time. Um, one of the things that we often forget about the deep ocean is that there's um, an aquifer that sits beneath the ocean. And this is kind of an unusual idea, but here on land we all have aquifers, right? And we can uh, drill wells to tap into that and pump water right. out. Well, believe it or not, the ocean crust also has its own aquifer. And there's a lot of um, seawater that circulates through that aquifer. So in the same way that uh, we have rainwater here that right. goes into the crust and then circulates through the yes. aquifer and comes out, you know, as wells and, uh, yeah. and, and uh, uh, natural wells or human-made wells. Uh, in the deep ocean crust, there's also uh, a crustal aquifer in which seawater percolates down through the crust uh, and then uh, is uh, ejected from um, another site. And most of those sites that, uh, that aquifer water comes out of are actually hydrothermal vents. Okay. And so they're areas of the um, uh, seafloor uh, that are uh, heated by the uh, magma underneath of it. So uh, in the same way that a coffee percolator works by boiling water at the bottom, 
and that, that water and steam comes up a tube and percolates through your grounds. Yes. Um, those oh, of us who are. This is a lot hotter. <laughs> yeah, this is a lot hotter. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and the percolator, for, for, for the younger ones in our audience, percolators <laughs> right, may right, be right, something right. you don't know about, but you can Pump still. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can still get them at camping stores. But um, these hydrothermal vents uh, are very similar to percolators in that the water's heated by a magma chamber and it comes up through cracks in the crust and it's emitted uh, into the colder overlying seawater. Now, what happens while that seawater is down in, in those rocks being heated is it gets chemically changed. Okay. And there are, um, uh, there's a lot of the compounds that normally uh, are dissolved in seawater, like oxygen, yeah. right, that are stripped out. And there are other compounds, uh, chemicals that are dissolved in seawater that are um, chemically altered. And so the water that comes out of these hydrothermal vents uh, is really very different than the water that came in. And so when we go to these hydrothermal vents, um, the first thing we see are these tall structures that uh, look like uh, the chimneys on your roof. Right. right. And so we call them chimneys. Right. Um, and those tall structures form as that hot water comes out of the crust and hits the ice cold seawater and all the dissolved metals uh, and other um, particulates come out of solution as that water is rapidly cooled and oxidized and they form these, these, these naturally occurring spires, these beautiful chimneys, some of which are taller than Notre Dame and Paris. Just to give you a sense oh, of how... Oh, I didn't realize they're so tall. Yeah. Not all of these chimneys are uh, as tall as Notre Dame, but many of them are. Okay. Um, and, and it turns out that these... Uh, the, the chemical and physical conditions of the water coming out of that vent are really different than the surrounding mm -hmm. bottom water. Uh, the temperature of water coming out of vents is typically around 250, sometimes as hot as 350 or 400 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that means it's hotter than the temperature in your oven on self-clean mode, right? So it's really hot. Now that water is also full of lots of chemicals that are frankly really toxic right. to most animals. Um, hydrogen sulfide is one example. Um, hydrogen sulfide, there's enough dissolved in this vent water uh, that comes out of the vents uh, that uh, it would be uh, poisonous to anybody in this room. Right. In fact, hydrogen sulfide is more poisonous than cyanide. I thought, yes, yeah, right. So, so it's so nasty it stuff. Right. There's a lot of heavy metals, uh, dissolved yeah. arsenic, uh, lead, and the like. Uh, the pH is really low. It's like the pH of vinegar. And so when we first went, when, when people first discovered these vents in the late 1970s, uh, they took all their sampling tools that they normally use yeah. in the ocean, their water samplers, their plastic water samplers, and, and their, their thermometers that go up to, say, 50 <laughs> degrees Celsius, and they went to try to measure the conditions yeah. of this vent water that was coming out. Uh, and it, 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 it melted their plastic, it charred their, their wooden handles, uh, and it dissolved their aluminum probes. So the conditions are really, really uh, uh, aggressive. Not a fun place, right? It's right. a really caustic yes, place. Right. Now, there's an interesting irony with hydrothermal vents because while that fluid that comes out of those chimneys, uh, which we call focused flow, that focused flow is really nasty. When it mixes with seawater, it ends up becoming a very energy rich uh, environment for microbes. And it turns out that some of the most productive places on Earth, right, on the whole planet, yeah. are hydrothermal vents. For microbes. And For microbes. Or, but, and, and there are other organisms around in the environment there too, right, right. that are right. multicellular kinds of things, right. like those guys. The, exactly. As you say, the poster child. That's right. right. It's the poster the, child uh, of the hydrothermal vent world. These yes. are um, tube worms. Yes. These tube worms uh, were one of the first uh, animals that scientists encountered when they went and they uh, studied the vents in the late 70s, right? And uh, it turns out that the biomass of these tube worm aggregations uh, is m greater than what we see in um, rainforests or forests. Isn't that something? Yeah. And this w with just these guys, well, basically uh, the these life guys around and, the and, and, a, and a number of the other animal right. communities that live around right. vents. And what I mean by biomass is that the amount of biological material on a square meter yeah. of the seafloor. If you look and you weigh it all, it turns out to be uh, similar to or in excess of, of, the, of a square meter of rainforest. Which you wouldn't right. expect with a, right. an area so completely hostile exactly. in our so, intuition for life. Indeed. So here we are on the seafloor in total darkness right. with 400 um, atmospheres of pressure, which is like 6,000 psi right. roughly, uh, uh, living 
centimeters uh, away from um, really hot caustic water that would kill these animals yeah. if they encountered that really uh -huh. hot water. So if they walked up to the vent, they'd right. be all, all over. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So it, it, That's why they stay out there. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and so these giant tube worms are gorgeous. Uh -huh. They're beautiful. And um, it turns out that they, they form these dense aggregations in the areas where that vent water has been mixing with the cold ocean water and produces a really nice, uh, almost bathtub-like temperature. So 70, 80, 90, you know, it's so like when we draw a nice warm bath, right, yeah. and soak in it. That's the temperature that these uh, um, worms live at. The same is true for um, uh, another uh, uh, group of animals at vents, the giant clams. And you can see here that these giant clams are enormous. There's a picture of one sitting in the palm of a fellow's hand. Yeah. Uh, these clams are about the size of a dinner plate, they're about the diameter of a dinner right. plate, and they're really heavy. And there are areas on the seafloor that are littered with these clams, where there's just, uh, we call this one site clam field. It's about an acre of clams. Now, one thing that's interesting is when we look at all of these, mic all of these animals, yeah these giant animals that live there, scientists didn't understand how they made a living. Yeah. Right? They couldn't figure it out. Right. Because in the deep ocean, away from vents, in general, you don't have this much biomass because all the animals are dependent on what rains down from above. Yes. And so a lot of work went into figuring out why is it that there's so much biomass here? All right? It can't just be temperature. They have to be eating something. And it turns out that the majority of these large animal communities or uh, assemblages at vents have one tiny little thing in common, and that is they're symbiotic with microbes, with bacteria. Okay, so you've got to have the little creatures down there. Right. Okay. And so as we, as, uh, we mentioned earlier, these vents uh, produce all these chemicals, like hydrogen sulfide, yeah. uh, that um, if you take that hydrogen sulfide and oxygen and just mix it in a test tube, right? Forget any biology for yes. a second. If you mix it in a test tube, you can release energy because the, these chemical reactions take place because hydrogen sulfide has a lot of electrons. Yes. Oxygen doesn't. It, it wants electrons. It's an electron hungry molecule or an oxidant, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you mix these two, the electrons will go from hydrogen sulfide to oxygen and it releases energy. And then those little creatures can slurp it up. Exactly. And that's the key point here. While this, um, I'm telling you about this process in a test tube, in fact, microbes harness that. Okay. And so the hydrothermal vent ecosystem is based upon microbes that have this ability to harness energy from chemical reactions. So let me put it this way, a plant. We all, we're familiar with plants, right? right? We all have uh, them in our and yards. we thought and this was the, or the necessity of life. That's right. Yeah. And, it's, and, and plants uh, use what we call photosynthesis. Yes. Right? So that means that they actually take energy from sunlight and they use that energy um, to convert carbon dioxide in our atmosphere right. to sugars. Right? And they do that, and then cows eat the plants, we eat the cows, at least some of us eat the cows, and then we go from there. Right? Right. So that's photosynthesis. But remember, there's no sunlight on the seafloor. Absolutely. It's perpetual yeah, darkness. And the, what allows these dense communities to thrive is chemosynthesis. These little microbes do what plants do. They convert carbon dioxide to sugars, uh, but they don't use sunlight to do that. They actually use these chemical reactions. They take hydrogen sulfide and oxygen and they harness the energy from that. Right? So that's okay. chemoautotrophic Okay. Um, and activity. it explains the sort of uh, symbiosis to their, of the mis that is, mutual need. That is spot need. on. Spot on. And so without these microbes, there would be no yeah. large animal communities around these vents. Right. So it's, it's a really interesting and exciting environment. And for many years, uh, people have been studying and continue to study the animals that live around these vents. I mentioned most of these big animals live in these um, you know, really uh, um, uh, kind of comfortable habitats. To say temperate zone. Temperature, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly for temperature. The, the, right. the chemicals are a whole other story for another time. Yeah. But, but they don't live at extreme temperatures. Okay, but the microbes. The microbes do. Okay. Now, I should say that m the most thermotolerant animals on Earth, that is the animals that can withstand the highest temperatures, live uh, in the deserts these desert fire ants, uh, they live in hot springs, these tiny little crabs, and they also live around hydrothermal vents. Uh, some little worms uh, that, that crawl and get really close to the hot water. All of those animals, deserts, hot springs, vents, 
they all seem to tolerate about 50 degrees Celsius. Very interesting. So there's yeah. like a, there's there's a theme a, here yeah, for right. animals. Exactly. So all animals, exactly. about 50 degrees C. That's right. about, I think, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. But you're, there you're talking about multi-cell uh, organisms. Right. Multi-cell okay. organisms, right. animals, true right. animals. Right. Microbes yeah. can deal with 50 degrees C. We know they can deal with 60, 70, 80, 90. In fact, the most thermotolerant microbe known today lives at 122 degrees Celsius. And that's pretty hot. It is. And so that's, um, that's uh, a temperature that we could never imagine exactly. an animal living at. Now, these hydrothermal vents yeah. um, host large communities of these free living extremophilic microbes. Yeah. We call them extremophilic because they live at what I would call the edge of our biosphere. Right? This is the area where you start to move into environments where we no longer see life. So I'll give you an example. That really yeah. hot fluid, that yes. vent fluid, yes. at 350 degrees C and acidic pHs, we don't think any microbes are actually living in there. They were surprised, were they, when they found them? Well, they found them close to that. Yeah. So at 350 degrees C, we don't see microbes there, but they live right up as close as they yeah. can get. And um, you can see in this little... Uh, schematic illustration here that in a hydrothermal vent chimney you have this chimney wall just just like you would in your own home you have you have a, a brick wall right, right right the microbes actually live inside that chimney wall and on the inside of the chimney it's really hot and on the outside it's really cold right on the inside, there's lots of hydrogen sulfide and these other chemicals that they use for chemoautotrophy. Okay, which you'll explain to us. Huh? Right. <laughs> and on the outside, there's lots of oxygen, uh, and that is again a, a molecule that that really likes you know the electrons that are found in these chemicals yeah. in the vents. So, we we know from sampling these hydrothermal vents, from collecting these chunks of chimney, that there are cells in there. But I have to tell you that we really don't know a lot about what these microbes are doing in the deep sea, either at vents or frankly in general. Yeah. So everything we know about microbes that you know about disease causing microbes right, and the right. like, and, and uh, all that comes from culturing less than a percent of the known microbial diversity. Right? And, and so we don't really have a good feel for what these microbes are, are really doing, right? We don't have a good feel for their, their metabolism. And so it turns out that, um, you know, as you know, all organisms have to generate energy, and, and metabolism, metabolism, is, it's a big word, but it really yeah. just means the series or set of chemical reactions that we organisms have to do to keep ourselves alive. Okay. Right? And fundamental to all organisms is you have to essentially harness energy. Okay. That's what you have to do. Right. And the way you and I do it is we'll go and we'll eat a, you know, a veggie burger or a salad. A veggie um, burger. Or hummus. <laughs> and, uh, uh, You'll take that, you'll take it in, and then you'll breathe in oxygen. So what happens next? Well, it turns out that in a very basic and kind of simplified sense, you're taking in that food, and that food is um, electron rich. Right? Okay. So, you know, uh, and when you start thinking about food being fat or calorie rich, you should also now think of it as being electron That's rich. That's what I'm going to think <laughs> yeah, in the future. Fair With enough. my righteous veggie burger. Exactly, yes. exactly. Okay. So you take in this electron rich um, material. And it's, it's, it's a bunch of chemicals, right? That's yes. what your hummus is. And then you breathe in oxygen. It's a bunch of natural chemicals, yes. but that's what they exactly. are. They're compounds. Exactly. And now you breathe in oxygen. And now your oxygen um, wants electrons. So you've got this stuff you've eaten that has a lot of electrons, and you've got oxygen that really wants electrons. Right. And your body has a bunch of enzymes th that assemble themselves into these pathways through which you can flow those electrons from your food to oxygen. Right. And that is how you harness the energy of those chemical reactions. Okay. So it's all chemistry it's all in chemistry, there. Right? And it's got to work really exactly. well. Exactly. Okay. And in the same way that a paddle wheel on a stream harnesses energy from a stream flowing right. downhill to yeah. grind grain or whatever, yeah. your body's biochemistry harnesses the energy from this flow of electrons. So at the end of the day, energy metabolism in organisms really comes down to a flow of electrons. And so we better appreciate electrons right. in the future. That's right. right. Okay. So whether it's you or newt or salamander right. or zebra or goldfish. Right. Or a microbe. Or a microbe. It's all flow of electrons. Okay, now here's where it gets wild. Yes. We start looking at these vent sulfides, and we start looking at this assemblage of, of material that forms the outside of these chimneys. Yeah. And we can measure chemicals in there. And we know that there's plenty of comp chemical compounds that have a lot of electrons, right? These electron-rich compounds. 
What they're missing, though, are the, the oxidants, those compounds that want electrons. Okay, yes. It turns out that there's a bunch of oxygen in the ambient seawater, but it doesn't penetrate those walls on a regular basis, right? So that's what we wanted to figure out. If I take this chimney wall and I break it off, I can use a microscope and I can see a whole bunch of cells. I can, I can, I can barely grow any of them, it turns out, nor, nor, nor can anybody else. Right. But I know they're there, yeah. and I know they have plenty of hydrogen sulfide and electron-rich chemicals, but where's the oxidant? Yes. And that's uh, what got us thinking about these extremophiles. What are they using as an oxidant and what are they doing? Yes. And so what I've shown here is a picture of a vent sulfide. And we're looking at a piece of sulfide that was a tube that I broke off and I've turned on end. And so you can see the wall, kind of a, a C-shaped wall yeah. there. That's the wall in which the microbes live. You'll notice that gold sparkling material. Yes. What do you think it is? Uh, that's fool's gold, right? That's, exactly that's right, because right, he told me that. It's okay. Fool's gold. <laughs> so it turns out that these hydrothermal vents um, pump out a lot of dissolved iron yeah. and a lot of dissolved hydrogen sulfide. And when they hit that cold seawater, they form fool's, fool's gold. And so these, these chimney pieces come up and they're really beautiful. And they and, look uh, gorgeous. And they're absolutely they? beautiful. Yes. It turns out that that fool's gold and a bunch of the other metals that are deposited in there are actually electrically conductive. Right? So, okay, so who thickens. cares? The plot thickens, right? <laughs> and then some, you know, one knee-jerk reaction might be, so? You know, copper yes. wires are electrically conductive. Yes. Like, well, so what then? So what does it matter that it's electrically conductive? Well, I remember I was mentioning to you that generating energy for any living organism is about flowing electrons from something with a lot more electrons to something that really wants it, right? right. And you know that you flow electrons through wires. That's um, right. All the wires that power all these lights and in right. our homes and the like. So in a different project, we had been studying microbes that we know use these kinds of conductors to um, these kinds of conductors that surround them in their environments. They use that to generate energy inside their cell. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this process I, yes. and how it came to be that we discovered that microbes living, these extremophiles, are using this particular process. So what's this process called? Um, it's called extracellular electron transfer. All right, it's a big word. But, or we big are phrase. not afraid. There's, a, There's an no acronym fear. for it, though, <laughs> That's right? right? E -E that we, thank you. Yeah, yes, we, call okay. it, we, we, we call it EET. Eat. Eat. Oh, I like it. <laughs> oh, I never thought of it. That's brilliant. All right, so we mentioned before that what you and I do to generate our energy is we eat something organic uh, in the literal sense of the word, meaning it's a you know plant matter or animal matter, right. and we use oxygen as an oxidant. Right. And we take electrons from our food, move it to oxygen, and we harness the energy of right. that process. Right. And so, intending no disrespect to my colleagues who study animals and, and the like, but that it's kind of boring. Like what you do to generate energy really isn't different than an alligator or a goldfish uh, or a canary. At the end or of the day. a microbe, huh? Right. <laughs> well, it is different than a microbe, and that's where it gets, and that's where it gets really exciting. Okay. Animals, every animal on Earth essentially. Oh, that's right. Yes. Right. Every right. animal on Earth essentially generates energy the same way. Yes. We need oxygen and we need food, that's right? Okay. Microbes uh, also need food, but they don't always need oxygen. Right. They can use things besides oxygen, and. And in, in, in a way, we're eating, we eat this food, we take in oxygen, and we have that chemical reaction and generate energy. Well, it turns out that some microbes can actually use rust as, instead of oxygen. Well, why rust? Well, rust is an iron oxide. Yes. It, is, it wants electrons, right? And there are a lot of different things in nature that we can't use that want electrons. Rust is one. There are other metal oxides. Uh, there are any number of other chemicals that, that want electrons, but we don't have the physiological ability to use those right. to move oxygen. So there are these microbes that carry out this process called EET, and what they do is they will also take in organic matter, say um, a sugar, or they'll take in something like hydrogen sulfide, something that has a lot of electrons. Okay. But then instead of using oxygen, they'll actually use rust. But you can't take rust into the cell very easily, right? right. Especially if it's a solid mineral exactly. block of rust. Exactly. So what they do is they take the electrons from inside their cell and they shuttle them to the outside of their cell and they dump them on something outside the cell. Right. That's EET. 
Right. An analogy would be like if you ate your veggie burger and there were no oxygen and you said, oh, where's a rusty plate? And you went and you put your hand on that plate, <laughs> just yes. touched it, yes. and you used that to breathe. Right. So we say these microbes breathe rocks or breathe oxides. So that's or what metals, ET is, or, or metals, whatever. Right? Right, Anything right. that is um, poison, yeah. that's on the outside that can accept an electron, yeah. uh, these EET microbes can generally use as an, to, you know, as an electron very acceptor. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay? So that's this whole process of EET. So let's step back for a second. I was telling you these chimneys yes. are conductive. Yes. And this is what really got us thinking. Like, okay, so if you're a microbe, and you live inside this m matrix of conductive metal flakes and you have all sorts of chemicals around you that have lots of electrons but you don't have anything around you that accepts them anything dissolved right can you actually use those conductive m m minerals the same way uh, we use wires to actually electrically access oxygen that's in the surrounding seawater out here okay so they have to get it yeah Okay. Right? So now that oxygen's far away, yes. but it is connected electrically to the microbe through this mineral matrix. Uh -huh. right? And that's what we set out to study. And I don't want to get sort of too caught up in the details of this, of this slide, but in a sense on the top I have a cross section of one of these chimney walls. Yes. And you can see that I have anoxic fluid on the inside. That just means fluid that has lots of hydrogen sulfide and no oxygen. And I have oxic or oxygen rich seawater right, on the right-hand side right. there. And uh, the microbes live in between those two conditions. Okay. And they live in this conductive mineral assemblage. Okay, right? so it's a very special environment. Right. Now remember, these are extremophiles, so right. not only do they live inside rocks, which is right. already extreme, right. but they live inside rocks that are, you know, 100 degrees Celsius right. and really acidic. Right. Uh, and, uh, and are, are full of hydrogen sulfide and other nasty compounds to you and me. And, but they need this oxidant because if they can get, if they can have access to an oxidant and they have all this other, you know, electron rich right. stuff, they can j harness a whole bunch of energy. Right. And the more energy you harness, the more work you can do and protect yourself from your environment. And more easily self-generate. Exactly. Okay. And they can start, then they start reproducing and then they they're like, and all is good. Baby microbes. Right, exactly. Right, right. So we set out to do a series of experiments to look at whether or not this process was happening. And the punchline here is that when we look at the, um, when we looked at these minerals, and we put these minerals in electrical continuity, if you will, right. with I oxygen. Yes. We got a bunch of microbes growing, and we could look at the genes that they were turning on and look at the food they were eating, and really we could see that they were really, really, really active. Right? So right. we went to the seafloor, brought up a natural chunk of this, and set up an experiment in the lab at high pressure, at high temperature. I was going to say, you have to really replicate the conditions oh, absolutely. very carefully. It's, okay. and, it's, and it's a lot of work, and it, that's it must one of be. our biggest challenges. Yeah. But we set the conditions up so that this sulfide mimicked what we see in nature. So one end of that mineral yeah. was in cold oxygenated seawater, right. and over on this end it was really, really hot and had nothing, no oxygen at all, but just a bunch of those hydrogen sulfides and all those other yeah. reduced chemicals. Right. And we found that microbes grew really, really well under that condition. But here's where it gets interesting. If we took the oxygen away yeah. over here, right. Even though these guys never chemically experienced it, right. we just took it away over here, right. nothing grew. Very interesting. Right? So it required that electrical connection for microbes to grow. Right. This is a bit Frankenstein-ish. Yes, it is. Right? You start it talking really about is. microbes it's scary. like there's electricity and you know Not who knows that, what's but going the on. Electricity is alive. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so what I'm showing you here is is a is a is a um, a zoomed in micrograph. It's a high magnification picture of microbes growing on um, a, a surface of a mineral that we did an experiment on. And what we did is is back in the lab we 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 said let's set up an artificial hydrothermal yeah. vent in the lab at where we have this these vent minerals and we have one end of those vent minerals uh, exposed to really really hot water with lots of sulfide and microbes and we expose the other end of it to cold water with oxygen yeah. right we kept the oxygen away from direct contact with the hot water and the microbes but we just wanted to ask the question, if I take oxygen away yeah. from this side, everything else is equal. 
I leave the, the same temperature, right. everything, and I just take oxygen away, what happens to the microbes over here? Because the, our hypothesis is that if they are electrically moving their electrons through these metal conductors to oxygen, mm -hmm. if I take those away, they should stop growing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's what we saw. Uh -huh. And so by doing this experiment, by changing one thing, that is the oxygen concentration, right. the electrical access to oxygen, right. changing that one thing, we showed that the microbes went from a, a, a lush community of microbes, which I'm showing you here in a micrograph. Yeah. They're falsely colored in green, so you can see the uh -huh. real microbes. Okay. But this is a picture of an aggregation of microbes on a mineral. When it was exposed, one end of that mineral was exposed to oxygen, electrical access to oxygen. When I took it away, we could not find any microbes with this same technique. Wow. We mm -hmm. then started looking at their gene expression so mm -hmm. we could extract mm -hmm. um, these things called RNAs uh, that are the ribonucleic acids mm -hmm. that express mm -hmm. genes. Mm -hmm. And we found that the microbes are doing what we thought they were doing. They're taking hydrogen sulfide as an electron-rich substance, yeah. and they're shuttling the electrons from that through this conductive matrix to oxygen, and they're using the energy from that to carry out chemoautotrophy. So they're fixing carbon just like the plants do. Only they're even more unique than their um, cooler dwelling counterparts because they live at this really high temperature. They don't ever come into direct contact with oxygen. They just get to it electrically yeah. through this EET process. It's a very interesting and discovery. It's, and it, it is really exciting because it tells us that these microbes that live in environments without oxygen may actually in some ways have access to oxygen um, through this uh, EET mm -hmm. and through electrical mm -hmm. conduction. Mm -hmm. Now it's important to keep in mind that the deep ocean is, is quite oxygen rich. So it has about half the amount of oxygen you see on the surface waters in the, in the cold ocean, right? And it's also important to remember that these little microbes are on the order of microns. And the distance between them and oxygen is a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand body lengths. I mean, it's really far away. Yeah. And so they are not ever in chemical contact with oxygen, and it's this EET process that allows them to get to it electrically. Right. And so it really changes the way we think about life in these oxygen, um, uh, uh, in these oxygen-free environments. Yeah. Uh, Harkening back to something we were talking about earlier, we can grow only a small fraction of the known microbial diversity. And I should say that the way we try to grow most microbes is we open up a cookbook, literally, yeah. that says make this media, yeah. put your microbe in it, and it should grow. Right? Typically that media has nothing to do with the conditions they see in nature. Th yes, so it's hard to synthesize these things, right. is that it? Right, and, and so the approach we've taken here is to say let's not make any assumptions about what they should or shouldn't grow in, but let's measure the chemical conditions in nature and the, te uh, the physical conditions and try to replicate them in the lab and, and do an experiment, right, to test the effect in this case of oxygen on microbes growing far, far away through this electrically right. conductive matrix. Right, and you discover this incredibly right. weird world. Right, and so it turns out that when we think about hydrothermal vents, um, as I'm sort of showing you in a slide here in yeah. a cross section, it looks like microbes living on the inside of this chimney walls, bacteria and, and archaea, archaea, both of them, right, uh, are carrying out processes like carbon fixation and sulfide oxidation. These are their, remember these different metabolisms I was telling you about? Um, by having access to oxygen through this process of EET, using the environment they live in, which is c electrically conducted, right. um, as uh, an electrical conductor or a wire. Yeah. And so because they have access to oxygen, we're suggesting that they're able to harvest more energy Right, because they have more of this oxidant, right. they have more places to dump those electrons. Right. Uh, and by generating more energy, they can now grow faster. Right. Uh, they can reproduce. reproduce. They can uh, detoxify some of the chemical compounds in their environment. So it really changes the way we think about it. They are no longer, and here's the fine point of it, as energy limited as we had presumed before. Right. Now it turns out um, that as we look around in different environments, uh, we find that this process of microbial EET seems almost ubiquitous. So in my research... That I, is new. It is. <laughs> That's it very is. new. And it turns out that, um, you know, in my research we study, um, we also happen to study uh, some sulfide-rich sediments like in estuaries and, and also these 
ga natural gas seeps and the like. Yeah. Uh, and we find that whenever we set up an experimental system to test for microbes or to identify microbes that are involved in this, we, we, we find them. Um, and that's true in the oceans. Uh, many of my colleagues do this on land, and we find EET microbes in land. And so this process may be more ubiquitous than we thought. And what really intrigues me is if these microbes do have uh, use EET to um, harness more energy, uh, and we know these microbes are playing a, a, a role in our planetary biogeochemical yes. cycles, what does this process mean for um, the rates of, of these, these, these cycles that these microbes are mediating? Yes. Right? So, as I mentioned, we, we know that there's a great deal of microbial diversity. We know that microbes play a role in keeping our planet and our biosphere healthy and running our planet, sequestering heavy metals out of seawater, yeah, right, for example, right. uh, producing oxygen. Right. Uh, and we know all of these things happen, but we don't exactly know who's doing it, and we don't really know how fast they're doing it. And every time we look at an, in an anaerobic environment, like a sediment or a hydrothermal vent, right. we see that there are some unique processes that are taking place there that only those anaerobes can do. But often we're left wondering, where are they getting all this energy to do yes. this? And it might be that EET and other undiscovered processes uh, are responsible for allowing those microbes to harness more energy and carry out those uh, biogeochemical cycles at rates that make more sense. Right. right. So in a sense, the planet is alive. Then you have this constant cycling that is due to the microbial life. Oh, oh yeah. So it's a whole, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a, a very complete system and you're just learning now, I assume, that the geo and the chemical and the bio, all of these things are, are go together in some way. They are. But at a very, these, these tiny little um, organisms are responsible for keeping this cycle. Exactly, so our planet's biosphere yeah. is run by microbes. Yes. That's the deal. And uh, if we, if all of humankind were to go away, They'd the biosphere would keep running. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> but conversely, if all the microbes exactly. were to go away, we disappear. it wouldn't. Exactly. So, right. And you're just learning a lot. Is this, is this sort of new still? I mean, so they found the extremophiles in the 70s and so on. But it, uh, my impression is that the EET part of it is quite new, that you're just discovering uh, a lot about that. Is that yeah. true or no, is that old? No, it is an interesting story. The first example of EET in a microbial culture yeah. um, was um, uh, uh, done or demonstrated in uh, 1918. Aha! The a first clever time someone soul did who? it, a group of scientists who were studying a microbe in culture with an electrode, and they found that if they added a particular chemical, they could get uh, electrons out of the microbe onto that electrode, and uh, uh, and thus this was the first demonstration of EET. But it's only been since about 2000 yeah. that scientists have really st stopped to think. Well, what is this? What does this really mean? Right. Most of the effort. Uh, in EET research has actually gone into um, harnessing electricity directly from microbes. Now I mentioned to you that uh, you can see in the top of the slide here that m microbes can use uh, rust uh, right. or like in, in at vents they use pyrite as a conductor to get to oxidants, um, these naturally occurring compounds in nature, and they make a living that way. Well, it turns out that if we build a system with an anode uh -huh. and a cathode, right, just <laughs> like our did. friends did, in, that's right, and just like our friends did in 1918, yeah. um, that you can actually get a microbe to grow on one of those electrodes and dump its electrons onto that. Okay. So most of the EET research over the last 10 years has been driven by a desire to find an alternative energy source. And since we know that there are microbes everywhere, and we know that they can break down and eat all sorts right. of crazy compounds that animals can't, and since we know that they can use EET to shuttle electrons right. to an anode, the thought was, can you actually get a microbe um, to eat sewage, for example, right. and take electrons off of sewage Recycle. and put it onto an electrode right. and power a city? Exactly. And so most of the effort in EET is still focused on that. My group and a few others are really focused on asking, well, what does this mean for natural biogeochemical yes, cycles what does for it running mean? our biosphere? <laughs> and that's a good question. That's what we hope uh, to contribute to over the yes, next few years. Right. I have to say, though, working in the deep ocean, um, 
is very difficult. Yes. And it, it, I have to get on a ship. And, I have to run And you the went down there, didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah. So we we often use the submarine Alvin. Yes. To go deep dives, to do deep dives to about say twelve thousand feet. Um, but every time I want to study uh, a community in the deep ocean, I have to write a grant, and then we, if it's funded, we get on a ship and we get our submarine, and we have just a few days to do work yes. down there. We build instruments and sensors with batteries that we put down there, and unfortunately, you know, the batteries run out of juice every you know few months, and now we have to get a ship and sub again and swap <laughs> the batteries out. There are no extension cords, right? <laughs> and so um, we've been working with a colleague of mine out at Oregon State University, a very wonderful professor named Claire Reimers. Um, we've been building microbial fuel cell powered sensor systems uh, that uh, literally take the electricity from the microbes in the sediment to power sensors that we use to study the microbes so in the sediment. So that you can sort of stay down there. Now right. that's an innovation. Right. And yes. it's, it's exciting because these systems don't, they're, uh, they don't um, in, in a sense run out of energy because they're open systems. A battery is a closed system. Right. There's only so many right. chemicals right. in a battery and then the game's over. Right. These systems uh, are harnessing electricity from EET microbes that are eating all the organic matter that's raining down from above. Yes. So we've had some. Um, we've had one running for greater than eight years now. Um, we're uh, currently in the process of testing testing these in the Monterey Canyon, and we outfit our sensors with acoustic modems so we can leave them down there, and from the comfort of our office, we can see the data. This is like and astronomy in reverse, really, but you're just deep it's sea. Space, and right? right, exactly, interspace. So, exactly. And as they say, you know, um, intra-terrestrial uh, life. That's right, looking uh, at the intra-terrestrials yeah. <laughs> in the sediment. And so just, I thought I'd also mention that yeah. th um, this there may be an opportunity here to use microbial um, fuel cells or microbial power to power LEDs and do things like charge cell phones in the developing world. Right. It may prove to be cost effective to generate that kind of electricity locally, small, modest amounts of power, right. rather than running, you know, a Grids. grid exactly. to power LED lights. Right. And so there are a number of, of organizations and groups that are that are looking into this. Um, and I've been working with quite a few of them to develop uh, to sort of develop this technology for the um, uh, the developing world. Right. Um, and so is uh, microbial fuel cell power going to replace fossil fuels? Not any time in the near future. But I think there's a lot that we can learn by studying EET in nature. Absolutely. And by uh, pursuing these relevant and modest applications, right? Powering right. sensor systems, powering lights, and right. charging cell phones. Um, because science is an iterative uh, process of innovation. Yes. And that the more uh, we do it, the better we become, and it's a really, frankly, in my opinion, um, a cost-effective ways, uh, a cost-effective means of, of really leading to, to uh, new innovation and new inventions. Yes. You know, much of what we've been talking about is this microbial process of, of EET, this 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 um, unique physiology that only microbes uh, yeah. are capable of, um, and and it's it, 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 as I mentioned, it's really. I think it forces us to reconsider some of our assumptions about life in anaerobic environments. But if we sort of step back a bit and think about hydrothermal vents in general, uh, one of the reasons that they've captivated uh, the, the minds and hearts of scientists and the public is that there are these really kind of oases in, a, in, a, in an ocean, you know, in, an, in something of an ocean desert, areas mm -hmm, where you have mm -hmm, lots mm -hmm, of organisms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not just animals, but microbes flourishing. Mm -hmm. And some of the most extreme uh, microbes, as you say, the extremophiles, these archaea, mm -hmm. right, which are very different from bacteria. Mm -hmm. They're microbes that really occupy the fringe of our biosphere. Um, and it's caused a lot of um, people to ask the question, you know, are vents where life began. And people have been putting that forward for quite a while now, that that's where right. it started. From what you've described, it looks like adaptation rather than or or originating. Mm -hmm. But archaea are very ancient, obviously, mm -hmm. and so I don't know, uh, what do you think? What do you think? So let's, let's um, no, th that's a, those are really good questions. And mm -hmm. I think uh, the questions about the origin of life, and, and, and we should also touch upon uh, life on other planets in a moment, uh, are, really, uh, are really intriguing, mm -hmm. right? And of course, they, they kind of, um, uh, they, 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 they speak to humankind's uh, desire to understand not only the origins of, of uh, life, but of, you know, of ourselves as well. But let's break this conversation down, advance into two different 
categories. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about animals at fence and microbes at fence. So the, with respect to the animals at fence, there was this hypothesis that maybe these are some of the oldest organisms you know, uh, right. around. Right. And so uh, m biologists use um, uh, what I'll call molecular biology mm -hmm. as a means of understanding how organisms are related to one another. And so basically what you do is, is you, you take an organism and you take a little sample of tissue or a blood sample or something and, and you, you look at its genes and you may sequence a gene or two or ten or the whole genome and you look at how closely, how similar that is to the gene or genomes of similar organisms. Mm -hmm. So you can take um, crabs that look alike. You can get a Jonah crab or a Dungeness mm -hmm. crab and a shore crab and a rock crab and so on. And you can look at the genes and ask the question, who's related to whom and in what order? Mm -hmm. And so the, the crab that, that sort of shares the most, um, kind of the most number of, of genes with all of the crabs you might you might say is the ancestral crab, right? And they sort of have adaptations mm -hmm, or they've mm -hmm, evolved mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. that crab. And it's not always that simplistic, but bear with me. When we look at animals at hydrothermal vents, we find that they're actually quite, um, uh, evolutionarily speaking, young. And so the crabs that live at hydrothermal vents um, are more closely related to intertidal shore crabs than they are to some of That's the other deeper crabs or some of the crabs that we think are more ancestral. Yeah. Same is true for the tube worms, right? And just because they look radically different doesn't mean right. that they're actually, surprisingly, they're not that different from annelids, right? From the, oh, for from the worms sake. you have in yes. your yards, right? So, yeah. um, so the animals seem to be quite derived and there's a lot of uh, good uh, reason to think that uh, that they um, kind of colonize these vents from different environs. Right. Um, okay. Perhaps call it a, a hundred or two hundred million years ago. I honestly can't remember the exact number. Right, right. But it, it wasn't. It wasn't um, in some sense that long ago. Right. Now for the microbes, it gets a little more complicated because there is still this debate as to whether or not all microbes are everywhere. Is everything yeah, everywhere? Right. You know, and does the environment select for which ones flourish? Right. Um, I can say that microbes that we believe to be um, quite um, old, if you will, or ancestral, uh, there are some that are found in vents, but there are also some that are found in, you know, gas seeps and in, right. in marine sediments and in, you know, in, 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 in soil in your backyard. So, so I think it's a little complicated. There's a, there are a lot of good reasons, uh, I'll call them um, Monday morning quarterback reasons mm -hmm. to say, oh, well, of course hydrothermal vents got to be where life originated. But I, I think it's more complicated than that, and I'd say that the verdict is still out. Okay. It would not be surprising to me if we find that hydrothermal vents or vent-like systems, like some of these um, more recent, they're, they're called serpentinizing systems, like uh, there's this feature called the Lost City in the Atlantic, which is giant. They look like vents, but they're actually giant chalk towers. There's reasons oh, to believe yeah, that they might, you know yes. what I'm talking about? There's reasons to believe that those systems might have contributed to the origin of life. Right. So I think the verdict's still out. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good to know because we're hearing these, you know, suddenly everybody's into the hydro vents as, oh, yeah. uh, as, a, as, a, as a source. And then uh, one more thing here, so you think of this as a, like an adaptation, mm -hmm. probably, and a pretty radical one, but mm -hmm. it does indicate that life could uh, if develop maybe under certain conditions, but certainly adapt in many sure, uh, extreme conditions. Sure. And it, it doesn't suggest, though, that you'll get big life. So, uh, would you predict from the vents, from the from these microorganisms using the EET, mm -hmm. that? these are single cell organisms have been for gazillions of years mm -hmm. apparently do you see them evolving would they uh, become multi-cell organisms do you think it's a confined thing no I, I think I think it's fair to say that every organism that's growing and living and reproducing on earth is continually evolving okay that's the bottom line all right and uh, the reason is that there there are always forces acting on organisms that um, influence their fitness, or yes. maybe another way of putting it is influence whether or not they live. So there's a, always a potential for additional is, right? uh, mutation there changes and, and uh, so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think that if you look at organisms now, where we have to remember that our lives are short-lived and our careers are, are, are yes, short, right, right. Uh, some perhaps shorter than others, and uh, um, and ultimately we have this snapshot in time. Yeah. Right? We, we, 
we go and we grab a sample of, of animals or microbes and we study them in the lab and we can spend a year or two studying that microbe and figuring out what its genome tells us and then by the time we publish the paper that same microbe yeah. in nature has evolved. <laughs> yes. It's right. moving target. So you got to watch him. <laughs> Keep yeah. an eye on yeah, it. That's right. That's all really very interesting and I'll let the audience ask some questions here to, uh, uh, quickly too. Uh, before though we close out I would like to mention, and I hope maybe you'll explain it a little bit, that you have at some point been involved in a project to encourage the citizen science. Oh, absolutely. How can people participate in something like this? About, um, goodness, about five to seven years ago now, uh, the uh, United States Congress funded uh, what is called the um, Ocean Observing Initiative. And it's, um, it was money set aside to build uh, undersea cabled observatories along the coasts, uh, uh, both coasts of the United States, and also deploy some global observatories to better understand the relationship between processes in the deeper ocean and mm -hmm. the shallower mm -hmm. ocean and the atmosphere. Mm. Um, it is, um, in my opinion, it w everything we know about ocean about the ocean right and uh, from from physical oceanography and the way currents move and the way surface water goes deep and deep water comes back right. and upwelling and all of that uh. influences productivity to me just screams that the deep ocean is intimately connected to the shallower ocean and frankly it's that's intimately connected um, to our you know those are all both in our biosphere but it's also intimately connected to our economy Yes. In terms, not just in terms of fisheries, world economy, but it's in, in terms of our world economy, and it, it, uh, it influences how we transport goods across the ocean, uh, how we generate energy, and so on. So, having said that, Congress said, "Great, let's build these observatories." And the scientists who were proponents of this, uh, to their credit, were champions of these systems being open access, meaning that it wouldn't just be uh, observatories that were run by a handful of scientists, mm -hmm. but as soon as the uh, infrastructure was up and the data was coming off the cabled observatory, including all the images mm -hmm. and all the videos, mm -hmm. those would be available to anybody 24 Which hours a day, fabulous. seven days a week. Right. So I would encourage including anybody to interested. other scientists all around the world, oh, I imagine, that it's open. Absolutely. Yes. So um, that infrastructure is currently being built. Yeah. Uh, they are, om they are mm, all of them are nearing operate fully full operational state. I'd say in the next uh, year or so, you'll see all of these coming online. I would encourage anyone who's interested to go to the Ocean Observing Initiatives website. You can search for that phrase. I will. I'll put it on the video. Exactly. And what you'll find there are links to these um, to these observing systems and how to, uh, uh, frankly, look at the data or get the videos and so on. I think that we scientists are soon going to be drinking out of a, the proverbial data fire hose here yes. because the amount of information coming through right. these systems right. uh, is going to be tremendous. And I'm hoping that scientists and the public step forward to develop mechanisms where scientists can help us, say, identify organisms exactly, that swim by, exactly. you know, or play a role in, in, in our understanding of the deep ocean. Right. So. What a way to do science. Oh, and it's, it's great. also to, for the first time in history, really involve the public, Then, and it's a whole new, uh, It's well, it's very good for all of us. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's really a participatory science Absolutely. coming up now. That's a wonderful project. Absolutely. And as much as I love diving in the Alvin submersible or other submersibles, there's I'll only bet you loved it. There, are, there, are, there are only three of us in that in that sub, and that means whatever we right. see is limited to those three people. Right. And now, at any given time, if I sit at my desk and I see a a shark swim by, a deep sea shark, there can be hundreds or thousands of people That's watching right. that as well. That's right. right. I mean, think and about the past. And you can catch it. You don't have to uh, count on, gosh, I hope everything goes well with this That's dive right. today That's and right. we have a few hours basically and it's right. a, such a production to get down there. Now you can just sit back with your coffee and uh, his veggie burger and uh, enjoy looking at this data. This is wonderful. Dr. Girgis, thanks very much for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over now, let people ask you questions. I will ask you to please repeat the question, and we had in a little interim, people asked a couple of things. If you want to ask it again, then you can. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, e. Wilson, of course, has uh, been. Yeah, instrumental in things like the bioblitz. And I participated in the Central Park bioblitz. 
Uh, in what ways will um, that kind of approach um, tie in or, or benefit you and your uh, and the ocean um, initiative? Uh, yeah. So you're asking about. Um, the bio blitz effort, right? And um, well, I'm asking if there are some parallels, or if you're integrating some of that their approach. Yeah, and so 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 um, the question then is, uh, can we look turn to the bio blitz or similar efforts, um, uh, perhaps as as inspiration for how we might do this kind of work in the deep ocean? Uh, and and I would say that yes, there have been a number of very very good uh, citizen science programs, if you will. Yeah, there really are. Now I think what's um, What's going to be uh, interesting is to see how the data that we get from these observing systems um, uh, differs in a sense than um, the kind of data that's collected by, um, say, citizen scientist bird watchers or, or, mm -hmm. or, or people collecting insects in a park and the like. Which is Frankly, more we typical. don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't really know. And so I, I really have to say to, to the credit of those who have been proponents of these ocean observing systems, I mean, these are open access systems. And um, that means that if you, for example, wanted to start a group of people to look at the data to, to map the distribution of, you know, rat tail fishes, you could do that. There's nothing that's stopping you from doing that. So I'm hoping, though, that we have more of a synergy between science scientists and the public so that we can um, uh, really capitalize on the data that's produced by these systems. So it is. It really is because it produces just what we need in terms of citizens today to be really well informed, and I think be great for kids too. Absolutely. This is a way to teach science. I'll tell you. Yep. Other people, do you have some more? You can ask the ones that you asked. Yes. Actually, my, my question is sort of on the properties of these vents. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I want to know where does the oxygen in the deep ocean come from? Oh, that was good. Oxygen and also, how old are these vents? You know, and do they do they ch you know do they change tectonically? Like you know, kind of how many years ago the Atlantic Ocean didn't exist in that yeah, yeah. And the actually the, the other question I have is, do you have like two worms at all different vents and all different oceans? How do they? Has anybody done a phylogenetic study? How they get around? <laughs> right. <laughs> so so uh, I'll answer that. Yeah. So you have Please so, repeat that. <laughs> so you have, you have um, three questions rolled up into one. <laughs> into one big question. <laughs> so first was the oxygen verbs. in the deep ocean. Yeah, number yeah. two, how old are vents? And number three are, you know, how do the vent <laughs> animals get around and do we have a good sense of who's related to who? <laughs> so starting with the question about oxygen, um, uh, the, the uh, you know, our ocean uh, essentially hosts one, what we call the giant conveyor belt. And that's a, a p pattern of circulation where um, surface waters that are uh, rich in oxygen from photosynthetic microbes, frankly, um, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes and um, uh, photosynthetic microbes are, uh, is um, driven into deeper depths, uh, carrying the oxygen with it. And conversely, uh, as it moves through those deeper depths, that water becomes more nutrient rich and then comes back to the surface, bringing all that, those nutrients with it. So that's a very um, simplified uh, answer to your question, but that's where that oxygen is, is derived from. It's really just derived from photosynthetic activity in shallower oceans. Um, and at the deep, in, the, in the deepest oceans, well not the deepest, but in, in deep oceans around vents, for example, it's about half the concentration you have in the surface waters, roughly speaking. Um, hydrothermal vents, each individual vent tends to be very short-lived, and vent fields are, frankly speaking, also likely short-lived. So we know from studying um, active hydrothermal vents as well as extinct sulfides, we can find toppled over chimneys in some of these vent fields, that um, an active vent may be around for tens of years. And that's about it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Many of them are actually only around for, you know, five to ten years, and they become uh, kind of plugged up with mineral deposits and they stop flowing or there's um, earthquake activity that changes the subsurface plumbing. A lot of reasons that vents um, kind of come and go. The animals around vents um, are typically, we call them weedy species, meaning we don't find a lot of vent endemic animals, meaning animals that live solely at vents, that have really long lives. There is no Galapagos oh. tortoise equivalent. They're all kind of like weeds. They grow, they grow really fast. They're like, you know, go, 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 spawn, 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 spawn. And then, you know, they spawn, and uh, that's 
pretty much it. So they, yeah. they all tend to be very, um, what uh, college would call, ecologists would call our selected organisms or reproductive, reproductive selective organisms.